Welcome to the Rabbi and the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Guri, Dr. Red Shoe, and my favorite rabbi, Dennis Galton. And the rabbi and I are delighted today because we have Judith um, Germain, who is the Maverick Paradox leader. She's a catalyst. Welcome, ma'am. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Judith. We were very excited to have Jude here for a variety of reasons. We believe that she has the right idea and the right heart for what leadership needs to be. I wanted to first start off with the idea of how did you come up with this idea of maverick leadership and then, and, and then the idea of a maverick paradox? How'd you come up with the idea? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. So for me, I wanted to look at what was it that made some leaders good and some people not so good. <laughs> and I suppose to distill it down, it was those that worked for the greater good who were prepared to risk everything for what's right, but would give up everything if they were wrong. So if you're, a, if you're a maverick leader, you have no ego. So you're not attached to being right. You just want the thing that is right. And you want everybody to win. You know, you want that triple win. You know, can you win? Can I win? Can society win? You know, and that's what you're going for all the time. And when I looked at that, I thought, there are certain types of people who who do this all the time and I recognize that the trait that they had was that they were willfully independent which is what I define mavericks are so that's how I got to maverick leadership as in the best type of leaders are what and what do they have in common and taking that on the road and testing it to see whether it, it works or not works and I came up with the idea of maverick paradox because I was confused because people tend to hire mavericks and they want maverick leaders but they only want them when there's a problem and mavericks being mavericks they fix a problem really quickly and then they look around and go i see another problem it may <laughs> happen to be someone else's department but that's neither here nor there <laughs> and that's where the problem comes so the paradox is is that they want the maverick to solve the problem and then they hate them for solving the problem and that doesn't make much sense to me. I think that's where the paradox lies. Well, and um, we had uh, an expert on inclusion, uh, Dr. Helen Turnbull, who said the same things happen. We hire for diversity, but then we lead for sameness. So that if someone comes in with a diversity of experience and thoughts and ideas, pretty soon we try and work them in so that they don't upset the apple cart. And I, I think you're, you're saying the same thing. I was pretty excited when I saw that you have brand new, I didn't know LinkedIn has a, a newsletter. So Jude has a newsletter on LinkedIn. I'm putting it in the chat right now. Um, and that'll be certainly in our show notes. Uh, and I urge you to go there, it's so exciting. And she's spreading the word on what does it take to be a good leader. Was, and the other idea is you said, some people are, maverick leaders only in some contexts and anyone can be a maverick leader uh, explain that please that's very exciting <laughs> okay so i think that when it comes to being a maverick you're a maverick by personality um or you could be a maverick only in the area of your expertise which often is at work so you go to work you stand up for what's right you challenge you have some strange and interesting ideas that always work out. And then you go home and you go, uh-huh, honey, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and you slip straight into compliance. But maverick leadership, maverick leaders is much broader than your personality. It's who you are and what you actually do. And everyone can be a maverick leader. Everyone can stand up for what's right. Everyone can stand up and be that devil's advocate. Um, and the thing about maverick leaders is that they will do the right thing. I mean, if you think about Jacinda in New Zealand, a woman's amazing, you know, she breastfeeds in parliament. <laughs> she stands up despite the rest of the world saying that she's crazy and sticks to, to what she believes in. And when she has an opportunity to denigrate others, she doesn't take it. 
What? See, I disagree with you. I don't think everyone can do that. I love that you think everyone can. Rebby, where do you where do you weigh in on that? I wish it was true that everyone could have the thought for the greater good. And I don't want to burst any of your bubbles, but <laughs> I've been around the block, and I just don't think that everyone is capable to have enough self love and confidence to not take the shot and to put others first all the time. Rebby, what do you think? Well, I'm going to go way out on a limb here and say that you're both right. <laughs> How diplomatic, sir. <laughs> I'm very out of character for me, I know. Um, it but, is. Pray tell, how could that possibly be? <laughs> because I believe we do all have the ability. We all have the capacity. I think everyone can be that type of leader. But like so many things, it's a choice. It's a choice. It's, it's, our, it's our desire. I mean, the sages say nothing stands before will. If you have the will to do something and it's something worth doing and you have the clarity and you have the commitment and the vision and the determination, you can make it happen. But how many of us actually have all that? Without, without the clarity of purpose, without the vision, and without the willingness, as Jude said, to put it on the line, to risk being the odd man out, the odd woman out, to risk infuriating people by telling them what they need to hear. Here's an example. See, a maverick leader will swim up, swim up that stream just like the salmon, even though they know there's a bear waiting to eat them they're still swimming. <laughs> and you know why? Because as a salmon fisher, uh, I know that the reason why they swim upstream is because that's where the best salmon are and because it's in their DNA and the bear there because that's where the best salmon. So it's worth the risk. And I do believe that if you're swimming in some sort of little tributary that's not so big and there's no bear, the fishing is, the fishing is not so good there. So that's, <laughs> that's my thing, it's worth that risk. So then I have a question. You have this ultimate faith in human beings, and I hope you're right. Let's say we're all supervisors of someone who is not quite putting others first, that is somehow limping along with ego and self-motivation. What can we do to have them all go to the Jude way, to the <laughs> maverick of the maverick leader? Well, as you may know, I used to be head of HR in so serious um, senior positions. And I firmly believe that not everyone can be saved because like Jan Hansen says, they might not want to be. So I think you always, you start off with trying to find out what is it that the other person is trying to achieve? Is it actually against the goals that you want them to do or not? Because it might not might not be, it might be they're just doing it the wrong way. So she has to find out, is there a meeting of minds? Is there a possibility to aligning things? And I think there's a big difference between can't do and won't do. Can't do, easy to fix. That's just teaching, mentoring. That's just skill transfer. Won't do. Now, why is there a won't do? Is it because they refuse to do it because it's against their principles or, it, you know, what is the reason for the won't? But Ultimately, if you can't align, they need to go. But that's okay. maverick from a HR person telling you that. <laughs> I, I think that's golden. I think that your book, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders, I've already put it in the chat, and I'm putting the Paradox um, Maverick Paradox Magazine link in the chat as well. I urge everyone to go there. I think you have secrets of the universe in there, correct? <laughs> right, and Jonathan's written as well for the magazine. I know so that's Jonathan. Too. See, and, and I can't I call him Jonathan. For me, he's yeah. always the rabbi. Rabbi, I saw your picture there as a maverick. How about that's that? Good. Uh, <laughs> it's actually somebody else's picture to make me look more of like a ma maverick. But, um, <laughs> the, you know, I think the key, and then what I what I what really drew me to you in the first place, uh, Judas, is the paradox element. Because I think that just sums up all of human existence. I mean, this is fundamental to, to my belief system that you know we're individuals living in a society, we're physical creatures who are aspiring to spiritual greatness, 
We have to focus on the immediate needs of now while keeping a sense of vision on the future. And this means that we are always in a state of tension. And when it comes to leadership, you know, I think about the, it was, um, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, someone came up with these models of parenting. You have the, you have the helicopter parent, right? always hovering to make sure that, that the, nothing, nothing bad happens. And you have the drill sergeant parent who, okay, you're gonna do this and do that and do that. And both of those, now I think they call them snowplow parents, <laughs> try, to, try to remove all the obstacles. Uh, but the problem with all of these is that you don't give the child the opportunity to grow and develop and you know, in the modern parlance to become anti-fragile, to, to become stronger by failing. And so the effective parenting model is the consultant, where you help children look at situations and recognize the potential consequences and the potential payoffs. And I think the same model applies for all leaders. So the best leaders are those who know when to relinquish leadership in order to empower the people for whom they're responsible and, and let those people learn to take responsibility for themselves rather than sit back, wait to be told what to do, don't take initiative, don't express ideas, don't risk objecting, then you end up with a, a calcified and a dysfunctional society. And so embracing this paradox is what allows us to succeed as individuals and as a community. So Jude, life, yeah, life is full of risk and you should take it. I think so. What is a parent to do if they find themselves blessed with a maverick child? What advice do you give? Sorry, you it cut out. I couldn't oh, hear. what's a parent to do if they find themselves blessed with a maverick child? <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I think that's really interesting because I, I, you know, you introverted mavericks respond quite differently from extroverted mavericks, and oddly enough, the introverted ones are much harder to deal with. Um, so an extroverted maverick will tell you when they're upset, they'll tell you when they're annoyed, they will warn you before they respond. Not the introvert, they just do it. <laughs> so if I say, if you, if you are blessed with a maverick child, what I would say is you have to handle them carefully in the sense that if you drop them, they'll break and they may stop being maverick because you're very fragile when you're young. And I think by helping them to explore who they are and their reasoning and helping them to always look for that greater good. I know that's what you want, but what does everybody else want? You know, because I remember most mavericks and most maverick leaders go through that extreme maverick stage and you hopefully you're not in there for very long. And I remember, you know, when I first when I was young, um, around about 17, I was very much on the brutal honesty side of things because that's how I wanted to be. You know, if I did something wrong, just tell me, I'll just change it. So I assumed everybody else was the same way. So if somebody said, am I good at this? And they weren't, I'll say, no, you're rubbish. And they'd get upset <laughs> and I'd be genuinely surprised. I just couldn't figure out what the problem was. Um, <laughs> it took a really good maverick leader to, to actually point out that it wasn't on and I had to change. So I was like, oh, okay. But it was a shock because I thought I was doing the right thing because I was really honest. And I thought I'd be helpful. Yeah. And that's <laughs> so part of the paradox, magic... isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly. part of the paradox, part of the paradox that, that genuinely you, doesn't you know, know. You have to accommodate others and their perceptions and, and their, you have to anticipate how people will respond, which seems again, inconsistent with the whole idea of being a maverick. And so there's this, this tug of war between the independence and the interdependence. Yeah, I would I always say that patience for the maverick leader is a learned trait. Because people say that, oh, this, you're so patient. Like, I took years to learn to do this because I figured this out <laughs> ages ago and you're still catching up. So I think it's that, but when you start to invert it and think, what's the right thing to do? 
it becomes easier to make that decision you know what's the right thing to do or I I learned quite early on in my life that yes I can I can say something hurtful to make you move quickly but what is the point of that because it's just because there's other ways it might take a light, bit longer but there's other ways to make you want to do the thing I want you to do and I think it's a sign of maturity to to realize that because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it I think it's that's perfect. back to ethics doesn't it doctor it, you know what it that and the road always lead back to ethics uh, I think that's <laughs> wonderful you have talked about in many of your articles the difference between uh, manipulating and influencing. If you wouldn't mind addressing that, I think that's a great point. Yeah, so the, the, the central difference really is one of intention. So if I want you to do something, why do I want you to do it? Is it because it benefits me or is it because it benefits us both? You know, what is, the, what is the driver? And I think if you are externally focused as well as internally focused, then you'll, you'll head towards influence. Because the one thing I noticed growing up was you can manipulate people for quite a while, but eventually they will revolt. Yes. And that, you know, <laughs> why go through that? That's just silly and pointless and a waste of time and resources and everything else. When it's much easier to make for people to love it and I, get, I suppose it also feeds into the fact that maverick leaders are great storytellers so whenever we want to align somebody to something we tell you the story imagine what would happen if this would happen and we could do this and we could go there we could and everyone's excited and enthused and he's just like well change is fast then much better than just trying to manipulate someone i'm not to feel bad anyway <laughs> i think it's wonderful so you're you're i think an interesting human in so many ways. Um, you're a keynote speaker, you're a podcaster, you're a consultant, an editor, you've been an HR guru, you've done all sorts of stuff. And yet I heard in one of the interviews that you didn't realize you were a maverick until later. So <laughs> two questions. How did you figure out you were a maverick? And why does it take us all a while to decide if we are or not? Well, it was somebody else who told me to basically out myself as a maverick because <laughs> I, I was writing about mavericks and stuff. And he said, you know what, you should just out yourself be more powerful. And at that time, the only mavericks I was talking about was the troublesome talent. So there were aspects that I was I could I could align myself with and other bits that I couldn't. So at that point, I hadn't split out socialized mavericks and extreme mavericks. I just had them in one big thing. So I couldn't quite fit into that mold. So I, it was uh, a title I didn't want to accept. So right. once he said, it was quite funny though, because once he said out yourself and I thought about it, I went really extreme maverick for a little while. And it was really weird. And I remember saying say to someone, it's all right, I can feel myself coming back to normal. It's almost like I had to just do it and then recalibrate, which was really interesting. And I think, and I think looking back, I. I had repressed a part of my personality, but not reconciled it. So I was talking to somebody the other day about Mavericks don't see things as comp compromising because we reconcile ourselves with the decision we've made. So it's not a, we don't lose anything, the decision, because it's reconciled. We wholeheartedly agree to take this decision. It's not a compromise. And I think that was the problem. I hadn't reconciled the different aspects of who I was. So I kind of acted out for a, you know, a couple of days. That's really fascinating to me. And, and I'd like to dive into that a little bit more because uh, I was very much the opposite. I mean, I've, I've been a maverick as long as I can remember um, and not always willingly uh, because it's, you know, it can be very lonely. This sense oh, yeah. that I'm not really I'm fitting like in it. with others. Do you, how, do, how do you manage that? You know what, I think it comes from a great deal of self-reflection. So, because when I was growing up, people just called me weird. <laughs> because I would know things, I could see things quicker than everybody else. And I could predict better than everybody else. And I'd be like, but I did, I wasn't careful with my language. It wasn't contextualized. So it'd be like, 
well, that's obvious. It's just this. Or what's the problem with that? You know, because I was thinking of moving in, in that way. But it wasn't careful. I mean, I was a good person, but it wasn't careful of people's feelings because the words I was saying wouldn't upset me. So I didn't see why it would upset other people. So it yes. wasn't, it was a lack of understanding as opposed to a deliberate hurt thing. So, and I agree with you, honestly, it's, it's lonely because you become, if you're not careful, you become the fighter, you become the one people come to with the problem because they're frightened to tell the boss or they're frightened to tell the bully or they're frightened. So you then take on that mantle. And if you're not careful, you become the warrior, but it's not your fight. So I had to, and I think it's common from people I speak to who are Mavericks that you have to pull yourself out of the fight to be able to help the fight, if that makes sense. Gosh, you ask really great questions. I've never talked about this before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really excited about your Maverick Paradox because I think it captures imaginations. It doesn't insult anyone or make people feel ashamed. And I think it's a great chance for people to ask themselves, am I a Maverick leader for some content areas or all the time? Because that's my personality. How am I raising the Mavericks? How am I supervising and hiring Mavericks or not? Can you, so here's the question I did have. What happens if you hire a team of all Mavericks? What happens then? Well, it depends. If you've hired a team, depends on the environment you're in. So if you're in a high pressured area where it's all about competition and, and being the top, you'll probably hire a whole load of extreme Mavericks and then life will be pretty hell. There'd be, dare I say, there'd be Enrons and places like that because yes. it would all be about the end results and how much money I can make and who do I need to put down to get there. Um, so that's not good. If you're blessed in hiring a number of socialised mavericks, so they're the ones that work for the greater good, then you'll have tension and conflict, but it will be creative and innovation. It would be no rubbish. People will... So, I mean, for example, I, I worked for a little while with two other socialised mavericks and it was amazing because we did what we said we were going to do. We disagreed, but still loved each other. We got a whole ton of stuff done. It was just so easy. It was just like, because everybody knew that whatever happened, it was meant from good intention. So if you made a mistake and you said the wrong thing, nobody would be defensive. It'd be like, oh, why do you feel like that? <laughs> and then you say because of this that's not what I meant oh okay then so you know it, it was kind of easy but what I would say now is that whether you want maverick leaders or not you no longer have the choice covid has said you need people who will do the right thing care for other people who will be accepting accepting of all but most importantly can understand the complex without relying on past data to pivot into something new and innovative. And only Maverick leaders can do that. Yes. Um, so whether you like it or not, if you haven't got some Maverick leaders, you need to grow some because you're not gonna survive or thrive anymore. And make sure that some of those Maverick leaders aren't just specific to a content, but are true Mavericks. Because what I've seen them is they brainstorm, then they come up with an innovation, but then there's trouble with implementation. Because with implementation, you have to be flexible. And if they're within a content area, this is where they call me for consultation. They don't know why they're having a hard time with the final step of this whole brainstorming. You know, they, they cannot actualize what they okay. thought was a good solution, you know? Yeah. So I would, what I would say is then they're not effective maverick leaders, but they might be mavericks by personality. So a maverick leader, when they go through that whole stage, yes. before they actually implement anything, they run that cycle in their heads first and they yes. test it and test it and test it. And if from their opinion that you, if you implement the solution and it doesn't solve the stated problem, they will not leave their desk and start working on it. They'll go back to, okay, what let's go back through until they run it through in their head that it's going to work they don't start and I think that lies the problems with companies because you'll have your maverick leader there that says it's not going to work and they just refuse to begin or, or because some people are really into implementing 
and you're listening to the solution, you're like, this isn't going to work. It's going it's to look great. But if this is the problem, this isn't yes. the solution. And that's where the bit of the paradox is like, we didn't hire you to really have an opinion. And I think that's a lot with companies. They hire people yes. who are good enough. Yes. But they want really good people because really good people challenge. Yes. <laughs> and that's what you want. You want people. We want organisations now where people say no or yes, if we could just do why, you know. I think when COVID hit, and it required a change of thinking. I think Mavericks everywhere got super excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. You know, there's a, uh, a kind of a meme going around that if, if you're the smartest person in the room, find another room. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's really what you're describing, Jude, that, you know, a Maverick is somebody who's not afraid to challenge or to be challenged. Be challenged. In fact, if you're not challenged, it's something's wrong. You know, I think that's the thing about Maverick, like, Maverick leaders is that they do not do, you know, sort of that kind of consensus bias. Because if everyone's agreeing, you're highly suspicious of that. You know, why does everybody agree with me? Uh, you know, no, that's not. So you would, if nobody else takes that like devil's advocate, you'll switch sides and you'll argue against it just to check that this is going to work or not work. Yeah, unanim unanimity is is not is not a good thing. And if there aren't voices that are objecting, that are forcing us to reevaluate and reconsider, then how can we be sure that we've examined all the angles that we've really thought the issue through? And and uh, I quote, quote, what's his name? Uh, Joseph Joubert, a French philosopher, he says it's better to um, debate an issue without resolving it than to resolve it without debating it. <laughs> good and it's the, it's that maverick mindset that i'm, I'm not just going to roll over and go along because it's convenient or it's easy expected uh i'm gonna, I'm gonna speak up because that's that's part of integrity and that's part of ethics and here's a warning for those who who employ other people if a maverick is arguing strongly for a position and they suddenly stop i'd question that it's probably because they've decided they don't care anymore Yes. And that's quite dangerous. You yes. know, if they're constantly kicked back and they literally don't have the power to make the change, they've just gone, sure, I'll do that. That's when I would worry. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that is one of the signs that there is not only serious problem, but when I go into an organization, I see a lot of people rolling their eyes at meetings. I yeah. often think now I'm thinking oh. the Jude way that I'm calling them Mavericks rather than the, the true seers is what I'd call them before. So it's a maverick who's rolling their eyes because that's all they can do. And you can see that soon they'll not work there anymore. So it's no, or, yeah, or they check out. They so do, they check out. There's this cognitive dissonance, isn't it? I, you know, I see myself as someone that, you know, does a good job, does this X, Y, Z. I cannot do that. So I need to now decide. So they might lessen their input to keep the status quo they're happy with. You know, and the thing I think the sad thing about Mavericks at work is that they can work at 30 percent of capacity or ability. And it, for other people, they think they're at 100 percent. And over time, that Maverick dies and you can see you can just see you can see the result of that. And that's dangerous because if you've got an extreme Maverick, they'll start hurting people because they're bored. And uh, socialized Mavericks will just leave after they've tried one one final time to, to, to put it back on track, and then they'll just go fine. And just Have you leave. created a measure for people to, uh, or an assessment for people to find out if someone's extreme or not, or where they are? I've been toying with that for some time. I do have a series of videos that explains the, the four different types of individuals. So that's the conformist, took me a long time to come up with a good friendly name for that <laughs> and then you've got the maverick behaviorist so that's the one that's a maverick what was the second one? one maverick behaviorist so they okay. behave like a socialized maverick at work generally speaking socialized maverick and you've got your extreme and i think it's a conformist will become maverick behaviorists when they're compelled to do so so covid um some life-changing event that or you know they've been made redundant they've got to do something different they'll and time will tell whether they'll fit back to conformity or not and then you've got your socialized mavericks and your extreme mavericks who are similar 
in ability, but it's all about intention. And one is externally focused and internally focused. And I say that a lot, but and I think I am not saying that socialized mavericks or maverick leaders allow themselves to be walked over. No, doesn't mean they don't care about what happens to themselves. No, but what they do is they hold almost in equal weight the good of others and the good of themselves. And certain, sometimes they'll sacrifice the good for themselves for the, great, for the greater good and other times they won't. But what they will do is they'll spend a long time making a decision. It's not a go-to, I need this, I won't do this. They'll spend some time thinking about what is the right thing. And, then, and even if they do then pick themselves, they'll struggle with it for a while, for quite a while. And they'll always like you go did. back, was that the right decision? Like you did. Yes, yeah. good. <laughs> so you have your maverick driven leadership model, which I found compelling. Please explain it to everyone. Yeah, I guess it's, a, I thought about it, it's the decisions. It's um, the decisions that all good leaders should make. So it's driven, and I love an acronym. So if you follow me anyway, you'll see there's acronyms everywhere. <laughs> so um, D is for determination. So how determined are you? to get this done and that means if someone comes up to you and say I just don't agree with you or you're crazy to do that do you still do it anyway R is about reputation so it's your reputation and the reputation of others you are associating with that is an equally as important and it's the two sides of character and competence so are you someone who could be trusted are you trustworthy do you have integrity do you do what you say? Are you competent in what sort of track record you've got? Influence, over, so eyes for influence, influence over manipulation. How do we all win? Um, v is for versatility. So how versatile are you? So one of the things that annoys me with a lot of leadership stars is that they're quite fixed, almost binary. You know, somebody moves this way, you move that way. Like we're just that robotic. People are, you know, that's only my, in my um, newsletter, leadership is, is personal. E is about execution. All Manfred leaders execute well. And N is around that narration. We tell a good story and that's how we align you because we'll, we'll paint the, the vision so well that you just want to come. It's going to be fun too. <laughs> Mavericks always have fun. Well, I have certainly um, bitten on the uh, Maverick Paradox bug. You've got me. You've influenced me fully. <laughs> <laughs> so much that what you're saying it's it's it comes to a, a topic that I think is is critical, which is trust. Yeah. Um, you know, people in, in 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 biblical Hebrew, the word for love is ahava, and it's related to the word lahava, which means flame. So, what does love have to do with a flame? Is that a flame is brought at the base and it tapers to a point? So, people have a common vision, a common sense of purpose that we're all headed in the right direction. But if we're all walking the same line, there's no perspective, there's no context, there's no interplay. If people are different from one another, different skills, different perspectives, but we have that common sense of vision, then our differences become a source of strength and unification. And we accomplish so much more together than any of us could as individually, as individuals. And, and it, it only works when there's trust. And trust is something that is developed over time. And so if I'm gonna take a chance, I'm gonna take a risk and I'm gonna get shut down, I'm gonna stop taking risks. If I take a risk or a chance, if I make a mistake, but I'm, held, I'm accountable, but I'm still supported, then I become encouraged, I become empowered, I become emboldened. And that's when our strengths really rise to the surface and, and allow us to work together to achieve great things. Yeah, that's said. perfectly said. Because I, I think people need a level of predictability with the people around them, i.e. if something happens, what will Jonathan do? You know, will he shout at me uh, okay well I'm not gonna I won't go and tell him then or what's what's he gonna do you know so I think 
people think that trust is gained in the moment of that exchange with each other and it's not it's with all the conversations you've ever been in it's all the times they overheard you talking to somebody it's when you rolled your eye when you didn't roll your eye all of that is taken in isn't it so when you get to that crunch point do I trust you and that's what we see with like with COVID and other world events isn't it where people are running around because I just don't know who to believe because we can no longer stand by and say I don't know I don't know but I trust you so I'll do what you say and it, it reminds me of when I was uh, 17 with this fantastic socialized maverick boss who it was just amazing um, and I remember one Sunday one one day he said right you're gonna have to come in the weekend for the next four weekends it's the whole team um, and I can't tell you why it just, you're just gonna have to come and I can't pay you any extra money but you should come and we all went yeah sure okay Pete and when we sat back and we went well can it? <laughs> like nobody even thought of asking him like why and this is the times when when they the company asked us all to work an extra 30 minutes in the week people threatened to go on strike so this is like so it wasn't like it was, and we were just like yeah we're well, coming and i remember i was elected to go ask him and he said oh this thing's coming and blah blah, blah. i was like okay fine. and it's because we just trusted him we didn't need him to tell us if he said we should come in we're coming in if we said go home we're going home and you know this is for people who wouldn't just follow anybody but he'd demonstrate trust over a period of time and i think that's what's really important in leadership is that Social, you know, I said it in my book, you know, the socialized mavericks, maverick leaders, they extend their reputation on behalf of the company, which is why they're so principled about what they will and won't do, because they know people are attending to their reputation, not the company's, it's their reputation on the line. So that's why you won't find them lying. We had a president, um, Grover Cleveland, a little over 100 years ago. And when he was running, I don't remember which newspaper it was, but a newspaper came out supporting him. Four reasons to vote for Grover Cleveland. One, he's an honest man. Two, he's an honest man. Three, he's an honest man. Four, he's an honest man. Can you imagine yes. that today? <laughs> you know what, that reminds me. When I worked, I worked in an organization, I was a new head of HR and I was changing a lot of things. And then one of my managers, she didn't like me much. And I remember there was a local, there was an election and she said, you know what, I kind of wish she was an MP because I'd vote for you. And I said, why? You don't like me. She goes, you know, being the maverick, I just state as is, you don't like me. She goes, yeah, I know. And he goes, but I trust you and I respect you. And then she said, it's not like I don't like you. I just don't like the fact I have to change. I was like, oh, okay. But it was interesting because you were saying, I don't even know which party you would support. But I know you wouldn't lie if you was in power. And I thought that was interesting. That That's is what it's supposed to work. You know, as you're not supposed to, <laughs> what do we do now? We vote for the politicians who tell us what we want to hear. And then we get mad at them for not doing what they say they're going to do because they've made so many promises they can't possibly keep them. As opposed to voting for the person who says, I'm going to do what is best for the country. And these are my qualifications. That's the way it's supposed to work. Supposed to work, yeah. So we've sabotaged the system ourselves by having unreasonable expectations from the people that we want to lead us. And well, and one leadership yeah. trait that I think we need to identify and encourage more is that a good leader doesn't need others to like them. Oh, it would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, but that's not how it works with votes. Please like me, please vote for me, right? But the thing is, I think it's not about, I think if you can, it's like whenever you used to do the psychometric tests, right? I don't know, in the UK, they were they were a rage for a while. Every single job you look for, psychometric. And they always used to say to, in my test, um, I have a strong need to be liked. And, um, you know, you get interviewed and they say, oh, I'm a bit concerned. I don't know if you could do this head of HR because you've got a strong need to be liked. And I'm like, yeah, I do need to be liked. But I don't expect that necessarily at work. <laughs> You know, I will do what needs to be done. Um, yes. And I think I think that's I think what happens is when people get into jobs, I suppose all marriages, I guess, is that they expect this one thing or one person to complete yes. everything. A bit like that uh, film, You Complete Me. I mean, how ridiculous is that? It might sound nice, but you one person or one thing can't complete you because it means that you take no responsibility for yourself for what you need. 
And I think when you get, whether it's a, a marriage of two people or whether it's you and a company, you have to find a way of reconciling. And I think if you, it's a bit like, in, it's a bit like in the, in, you know, it's a bit like you're looking at it and you say, if I'm only fixed on doing what's right for you, because I know you only care about what's right for me, between us, we have the best solution. Wow. You're making me think, guys. <laughs> well, good. Well, the rabbi and I always get back to the point that ethics begins with accountability. And how are we contributing to things going well, whether it's in a marriage or a friendship or a work relationship or, or in a podcast relationship? I mean, the rabbi and I cherish our differences. We are very different people. With Der I mean, I'm Cuban Catholic. He's a, he's a rabbi. I mean, it's really different and we love our differences and they do cause us to, to, to work on our tempers and work on wanting to listen better. And <laughs> it makes us stronger, you know, I mean, we can vehemently disagree and it's ex very exciting because we listen and I, I cherish that. It's nice to have someone else um, that can hold me accountable too. Like if I, if I misspeak or whatever, it's lovely. To have it's that. Hard to argue with doctors, so <laughs> you know what? I, I, you know what? I think I totally. Because I'm always right. <laughs> you always think you are. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I think if maverick leaders see those kind of debates, um, discussions, arguments, whatever you want to call them, as a really great intellectual workout. You know, it's like necessary. Yeah. It's a bit like pumping iron. Right, know, and an ethical your workout brain a too. Good shape. Right. And then, you know, go find the person that disagrees with you the most and have a good conversation, you know, and learn something. So, yeah, I totally understand that. I quite like to have somebody that I respect I can argue with. Well, one of the exercises that I do with some teams that are in conflict, I'm a psychologist, so I get called to help teams that are working less than lovely, right? And so I might say, go pick someone that you clash with. And... Um, and sometimes I actually have them as a small enough group pick the one they clash with. Other times I create avatars of people that clash and then they each represent their clashing avatar. That's safer for groups that aren't as sophisticated or are um, fragile at the moment. And, and then they come up with that idea. It's fascinating. I talk about this in my TED talk that you know, 2000 years ago, there were two schools of two academies of, of Torah learning scholarship. And history says when they debated in the study hall, they became so impassioned. It was as if they fought with swords and spears. But when they left the study hall, they were friends. It was never personal because that's the ideal. They respected each other. They respected each other's motives and intentions and, 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 and uh, sincerity. And, and even though they rarely came to a meeting of minds, they, we have recorded their teachings and their debates, and they continue to influence Jewish law and practice 2,000 years later, because it's only through that passionate engagement, that constructive dis disagreement, that you come closer to the truth, and that really should be what we're all after. Yeah, I, I think what you got there, I would say, is the how you argue. So it's very you know it's all very well to have um, a disagreement and yet you both kind of attack each other's you know argument but do you use toxic language against the other person you know yes. so I think the, the difference with a maverick leader is that they won't go after the person even if that might mean that they win the argument quickly so I can say well actually yes. you, know, blah, 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 blah. you know and if you're looking for the win-win-win you're always looking to see where you can align and where you yes. can influence. So you're not going to destroy the person. And I think that's the problem that you can't, you don't see much ethical debate anymore. Right. You know? No, you don't. You don't We're into the cancel going culture. for the person. You know, and you make up it's derogatory good TV. discouraging names for people rather than actually engaging yeah. in ideas. And yet a good conflict is the nexus for amazing learning and growth and innovation. Um, it's amazing. Find a good conflict and examine it. And there is yumminess there. You know, that's a very sophisticated term. Yummy. <laughs> you know, they also say that it's, it's the best way to um, 
to slow down or, or, or prevent or reverse even the, the onset of, of a decline, mental acuity you know, and dementia and such is the best thing you can do is talk to people you disagree with in a constructive way. And that's why God created family. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> There's always going to be some, and we've got holidays. Thanksgiving's coming, coming up. So. <laughs> so people's IQ points will be safe, you know, with this holiday season. All right. So now we're come to the time where Jude, you're going to be thinking about one, uh, uh, an, an action plan or something you want to say as the final words of wisdom. And we go to the good rabbi for the word of the day, sir. The word of the day today chosen specifically for our guest is iconoclast. Now an iconoclast was originally um, a kind of a heretic, um, <laughs> sort of a strange word for a rabbi to be choosing. Um, somebody would challenge the conventions of the church. Um, I think it was David Gallertner, I think in, in the American Standard a number of years ago, he said that politics has become the new religion. And that the problem with that is that when people become religious in their political beliefs, it becomes dogma. There isn't debate, there isn't discussion, because if you attack my position, well, that is heresy. And so in a, in a, in a society like that, it can be a good thing to be an iconoclast, to confront people with the inconsistencies. I mean, we know it, it doesn't always end well. We know what happened to Socrates. Um, and all he did was ask questions. And back then, people who asked questions were annoying and annoying people got put to death. Um, and the worst kind of cancel culture. But the concept of being a maverick is being willing, willing to challenge, being willing to you know, suggest that things, the established, the conventional wisdom may not be on target, may not be right. There may be other perspectives. There may be other ways of looking at things. So to be a little bit iconoclastic while still being polite, being civil, being respectful, uh, and when necessary, being diplomatic, the maverick is the one who can strike that balance. And that really is the sign of effective leadership. Wow. I love that. That's perfect. And it, I think it's fitting for you, Jude. Yeah, I, I, I do love that. I was just trying not to sort of grin too broadly as you were talking. I think what strikes to me, if you're going to make it happen, is how, it's a question around how do you identify? Maverick leaders identify themselves by their values. Those who are maverick leaders tend to identify themselves by their collective values identity so if you identify yourself with a collective i am a i don't know um political stance here or i am a nurse or i am this then it's harder to change your mind it's harder to attack the institution or the idea that's wrong because it's your identity it's like pulling a football team or something whereas with mavericks because they identify with values and people who are like-minded values they're not attached to the collective. So they're not attached to the problem. So I would say that if you want to be that maverick um, is to try to look at yourself as an identity of one. <laughs> I am me, you know, this is my values, this is what I believe, this is what I lead with. Then it's easier to then align and have disagreement with people because it's not a, an attack on you as an individual when someone disagrees with you. They're just attacking your current thought process on something. And then that enables you to change it and to move it. And I think if you're thinking about what is my end goal? If my end goal is to make why happen, how do I make why happen? Now, you're in a shout at someone and calling them an idiot isn't going to make why happen. You know, basic psychology tells you that does not work. <laughs> or just think of your siblings when you're growing up. They don't work, calling them an idiot. Um, so look to see what is, what is tethering the other person to their viewpoint and seeing whether you can cut that tether. Did that answer Thank your question? You. <laughs> and then some, that was beautiful. Yeah. And uh, you know, 
Thank you, Jude, for, for helping us see how to navigate the challenges of leadership and followership, because in some sense, we're all leaders, even when we're following. Uh, mm-hmm. we no, when when's the right time for the right role? And, uh, and that willingness to not just go along to get along um, and not just object to be objectionable. Um, somewhere in between is where we find the Maverick leader. And thank you for helping us see that more clearly. And doctor, do you have a last word for us? Well, I think Rabbi, we were very smart to have Jude on. We're just brilliant. Um, (laughs) One point as, um, as a seasoned psychologist and grandmother, I'm going to make a call to action to everyone. Ask yourself, are you a Maverick? If Jude is right, everyone can be one. And that means you have enough confidence and clarity in your values that you can take the hits that it that required in any situation to really listen to other people, to set your own tone, and to inspire others to the greater good, rather than bully your way through or call names. In my family, there was an old argument. We had all come to this country and my father had older brothers, and they were all very sophisticated, and they all had a huge sense of humor. And they were all arguing about some silly point. And suddenly, one of the brothers said, and your feet stink, because there was no (laughs) way of ending the solution. So they decided to make up a silly argument to put down. And everyone laughed, because we all knew it wasn't really a solution. But in the cartoons, it would have been that if you can shut people up, you won, which is not true. So my question to everyone is, how are you helping other people to speak up, to do the right thing for the greater good? Is that is after all why the rabbi and the shrink exists. We want people to elevate critical thinking, right action and civil conversation. And Jude, wow. I mean, your, your (laughs) your last name says it all. You are indeed germane to the leadership of the world. And um, wow. (laughs) <laughs> the maverick paradox lives on and um may everyone please go uh to our links and check out her book uh her linkedin uh magazine her other magazine she's she's got something to say and if you if you dare to risk greatness read and listen to her as i do think that she will inspire the courage and the confidence to be all that you can be That's all I have to say. Uh, As always, thank you, Rabbi, for being on. Jude, words do not express. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll see you all for the next episode of The Rabbi and the Shrink. For questions and comments, go to podcast at therabbiandtheshrink.com. Thank you all and be well.